go. Good morning, section two of electronic literature. This is me, professor. Um, so I should be, yeah, it looks like the background sound is back down. So hopefully you can hear me okay and hopefully things look all right. Um, as you can see, I'm here in a normal place on Twitch and uh, your words will appear here and you can see the chat was pretty lively in the first section so I look forward to more discussion today this will be kind of a I mean it's a lecture obviously but uh, some opportunities for interaction and questioning and, and discussing and you'll see that and be able to do that shortly um, but yeah this is Friday the the Friday of the first week of classes so um, it's good to see you all online don't forget to say hi either on Twitch or on Discord whichever you're watching on so I kind of know who's here uh, but it looks like most of you are here because I've got 22 viewers so it must be a fair amount so Good to see you all. Um, something you may notice is that you are color coded now. So as you look at it up here, you'll see yourself appearing in, in different colors. I've put you all into what's called a role in Discord, uh, essentially a group. And so that lets me address you all as a group if I need to, like at section two, and like, by typing at section two, and you can do that as well if you need to. Um, you, those are currently different colors. I might I might change the colors, but uh, for now. You all are a, a kind of bright green color, and section one is a kind of a, a magenta, I guess, or maroon kind of color. And you can see the color shifting. Actually, if you look down the uh, the channel here, it went from you know marooned and gold from me, and then green for you all. So yeah, you all are sort of the green team for now. Um, I might I might uh, mix up the color scheme later on, but we'll see. But I like green. Green's a good color. Um, so good. Yeah, good to see you all. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, so we met on Zoom on Wednesday. This is another live stream today. Um, part of what I wanna to do today is talk about logistics and some plans, get a sense of your ideas and plans um, going forward. Uh, there were some good suggestions in that discussion on Wednesday, so I took some of those and I, I thought about it a little bit. I have a proposal for you. Um, and then, but I also, I wanna get a little bit more information from you and then kind of explain how that's going to work, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah. Um, this is it, here we are. You can see my, my bird cam way over there. Uh, actually got a bird on camera yesterday and I went live on Twitch when it happened because I was so excited. In fact, there were two birds, so that was a big deal. So it's, you can watch the, uh, it, all, all those are archived on Twitch. So if you wanna go back and look at, you know, six minutes of a bird eating, <laughs> it really happened. Uh, there were two birds, one was a, a female cardinal and one was, we, we were debating, it was either a sparrow, but my daughter thought it was a yellow warbler. And so we were like back and forth. They look similar, so it kind of doesn't matter. But the, the sparrow slash warbler one was gonna be, um, it, it's, it's come back and forth a lot. Like it's actually, I've seen it, I'm pretty sure I've seen the same, it's the same bird um, that comes here often. Uh, but when I say often, like once a day, <laughs> but that's the most that I've seen. I, my hunch was yesterday that the cardinal um, was trying to get out of the wind because it was really windy yesterday and this is in kind of a sheltered area so maybe she was just like I need a break and so she just kind of chilled out down there um, and yeah sparrow is a very common bird I mean you can if you know about birds you're welcome of course to take a look at the video and if you have any theories uh, or if you want to try to match it then by all means um, we, uh, we actually have that have that record we can review if we want to um, the yeah, I'm still, I am still planning on moving it though because I think it's a little close. And I have noticed a couple times where I thought there was a bird out there and then I opened my curtain and then it flew away. So I think they actually can see me and they might be freaked out by me, um, which is understandable. So I think if I move it out a little bit away from the side, it won't be as sheltered, but that might be a good thing for birds to have different ways to get in and out of it. So I don't know, we'll see. It's just something fun to, to do. I need a slightly longer USB cable because this is not a wireless webcam. This is an old, old webcam. That's why I don't mind leaving it outside. Um, but it's just a wired USB camera, so I need to get a longer cable maybe or patch a couple of them together. And uh, that would work, I guess. So yeah, that's what's going on in my backyard <laughs> today. It's very, very cold uh, today, but sunny. Looks like we might have some snow and rain this weekend, so that'll be interesting to look forward to, I guess. Um, certainly gonna complicate things for those of you moving in on Sunday, but hopefully that goes well, or as well as possible under the circumstances. Um, you know, at least you get to move in, um, but yeah, maybe not great. Uh, and actually, I mean, I won't be surprised if class gets canceled on Monday, except that like this class won't be canceled on Monday because we'll be online anyway. So <laughs> sorry about that, but 
um, we'll go, uh, I'll be live streaming again on Monday. So, um, you know, you don't have to travel or walk down campus walk to do that, hopefully. Um, oh, okay, good. That's good to hear. Moon, moon. <laughs> Yeah, I, I imagine that they would they would give you all flexibility to do that. But um, you're an RA though, right? Like you probably have to get in early anyway, uh, or have a have a chance to. Um, anyway, um, today we're going to talk about electronic literature, and specifically, I've asked you to take a look at one in particular, and I want to talk through that a little bit to help you get a sense of how to talk about electronic literature. Oh, you're not? I guess I was mistaken. Okay, maybe you used to be. I don't know. Doesn't matter. <laughs> I guess I was just putting the wrong thoughts together. Um, so I wanted to, before that, this is a brief like commercial interlude, although I don't have actually a commercial stake in this and I'm not getting paid for this endorsement, but I wanted to mention something really cool that I got to do last night um, and that you all could do if you are interested. So there is, and I've mentioned this before, if you were, I can't remember if anyone in this section was in my games and culture class over the winter term, uh, but we did uh, have a chance to talk with these um, people, but um, you should know about this. I, I think I'm, I'm telling you about this now. Uh, there is a location, there's a space in Fredericksburg called Reclaim Arcade. It is a side venture of Reclaim Hosting, and Reclaim Hosting provides the back end for UMW Domains, and they are also a, a hosting company, and I, I host several of my websites with them. Um, they has also they have, they have just launched, and today is their grand opening, or it's like a soft opening, actually, but today is their first opening day for Reclaim Arcade, and I got to go spend some time there last night, a couple hours, and it's a really amazing experience. Um, so they've got, I think they have currently 57 games working, um, which is amazing, and some really amazing games, um, mostly older games. Like So this is more of a historical kind of retro experience um, as an arcade, but some really interesting, and in some cases kind of rare games like Battlezone and Tron um, and Star Wars. Um, this, the, it's like the Star Wars X-Wing game. Lots of really good games. Um, and they're really fun. So we went there for a couple hours last night, me and my kids, and we had a great time. Um, yeah, Tron. So it was a Tron game based, it was like released. Um, so there's actually two different Tron games that I know of. And one had a full like stand up inside of it cabinet kind of thing. But this one was just like, you just stand up and you play it. But it's based on the movie, you know, and it's, uh, it's really hard. I really struggled with it and I was not successful. And I think as a game, that was kind of its reputation is that it was not a super successful arcade game even though the movie was amazing so it was like uh it's still it's pretty good but um not amazing i guess but it was an interesting experience and um yeah they have a star wars game it's a i don't remember exactly the name of this exact arcade cabinet but it, it um it's old it's like it's like 82 ish i think and it, 1982 ish and it's um it's got the ve it's a, uh, vector graphics so you're flying in a x-wing and you're shooting you know tie fighters um very good very nice looking but it's, it's vector graphics so everything is like polygons and lines and uh, very cool aesthetic uh tempest they got tempest i played tempest for a while uh bobby i don't know of any discount systems yet they really just released the one pricing model right now but they have talked about making more options at some point um but right right now they're just kind of launching this and seeing how it goes and then they're going to look at other options um, eventually they're going to be adding food like actual sort of like a bar like the, so you can if you're 21 you can purchase alcohol um, th but that's more like later you know maybe next winter kind of thing at this point um, just because they're kind of trying to kind of get get it going and get a sense of, of uh, you know customer base for it so yeah it's um, 20 dollars a person uh, for two hours which is you know it's a good way to spend two hours I think um, but it's something you have probably plan for and maybe not do every day but um, it's the whole experience is it's a it's a whole experience like you walk in through reclaim video Which is something they've had for a while now. It's actually a VHS rental store So if you have a VCR and you want to rent a tape you can rent a tape from them um, But th th that's not really a viable business model. So that, that's not it's more of an art exhibit than anything um, But it's there and you can you can rent some tapes or watch some tapes there You can't uh, borrow a VCR because VCRs are fragile and expensive But if you have one that works then you're welcome to borrow a tape. I think um, and then you go, you walk through there into the 80s console living room, and this is a, a recreation of a project that we created a few years ago, uh, me and Jim Groom, who's one of the co-owners of the space. We created the console living room in the Convergence Center, kind of uh, pretty soon after the, the, that building opened. And it was an 80s style living room uh, full of uh, media and con game consoles from that era, so you could sit down and play. Uh, really fun experience, and it was a, you know, a shame we had to take it down. Um, but they've recreated at Reclaim, um, so I'm super excited about that, and it's a great place to just hang out. 
um, and, and pretend that it's 1978 or whatever year you think it is. It actually does skew more late 70s than early 80s, I think. Um, but that's okay. Um, but then the actual arcade experience, they got 57 stand-up machines, um, like eight or nine pinball machines, some really excellent pinball machines, if you like that, and uh, just a lot of fun. So I really, I really strongly recommend you check it out if you have time and, and want to spend some time. It would be a great way to, you know, get a few people together and go play. Their, their capacity is limited to 20 right now uh, just because of COVID, but eventually they're going to open it up. You can also book the whole space if you want to do a party. Like you can book, and I think that's $250 to book the whole space like for a big group if you wanted. So there's a slight discount there if you wanted to kind of do that and plan ahead with enough people and um, things like that. So yeah, uh, a really cool space. And I was glad to be a part of uh, inspiring the project and helping them get, well, I mean, I didn't really help much, but I we did the console living room together and now they're doing this business venture and it's a lot of fun, so you should check it out. Okay, so let's talk about electronic literature. Um, there are a few things I want to talk about in terms of the scheduling and so on, like we talked about um, uh, on, on Wednesday. So first of all, as I already mentioned, you've got sections one and two as roles in Discord, and I will probably be using other roles to identify the cohorts for when you're attending face-to-face -face or not, uh, that kind of thing. Um, you do have some homework due today. Um, that's in Canvas, and it's really just a complete or incomplete grade, um, no minimum or maximum length or even format. Um, if you want to, I think I've set it up, I don't remember if I set it up this way or not actually, but you, uh, if you want to, for these homeworks, uh, record yourself talking and explaining some things, that would be okay too. Um, the point of this is really just that it shows me that you're prepared for class, like that you've read, or in this case, you've played through 10 Lost Boys, and so um, when I talk about it, or if I ask you questions about it, you've already got something to say about it, and that'll help us have an easier conversation. Um, but also it's just kind of you're, you're kind of showing me that you're, you're doing that work and putting it in. It also kind of serves as a proxy for attendance since I'm not going to actually use the attendance thing in Canvas um, because it's just too much to think of in terms of like who's actually watching versus who's, you know, not really. It's just a way to kind of show your consistent engagement with their class. And so if someone has not turned in homework for two weeks in a row or something, that would be uh, a signal to me that something's going on and I need to figure out uh, where they are. Um, but yeah, otherwise, yeah, that's, that's the main purpose there. So, um, but yeah, I will grade it in complete or, inc complete or incomplete. I probably won't respond to them much at all, like with comments or anything, unless there's something really, if you say something really unusual or really, you know, striking, then I might. Um, but it really, it, mostly it's just kind of to, to kind of show that you're doing that work. So um, yeah, don't worry too much about what you write for those. Uh, those are meant, like for, the, for today, certainly, it was meant to be just your impressions and thoughts. So those can be whatever they are. Um, sometimes they will, there will be more targeted questions, um, and also I'm going to create a default set of options that are always available for you to do, as, and that will involve some more creative choices. Um, I'll explain those whenever it's, whenever it's applicable, but it's not applicable yet. All right, so I do have a plan to propose for how to proceed with our scheduling and how to approach the hybridity of this class. Um, I, got, I, I got sort of an impression of that from your your welcome survey responses and so i appreciate that but i wanted to pose that question again to you all. i just noticed that is it still playing it's not still playing music is it well it's muted anyway but it's acting like it is like it keeps popping up in twitch like it's playing a new track but oh yeah it is playing it's just i'm not i have it muted anyway so sorry about that uh, so the the, I'm going to put a poll in Discord. I'm going to type a question and then give you two different emoji to respond. So like, click whichever emoji corresponds to your uh, your choice. So, um, okay. So let me type it here. It took me a minute to type it here. So given the opportunity, um, okay, so let me back up a little bit. The, the context of this question is. Um, many of you, it seems like, are available to attend face to face. But when I pose that question as "Are you available or not?", you might have intended to say like, yes, I am available, but I'd rather not come in. So it's not I'm not totally, I'm not totally sure if that means that in fact, a majority of you do want to attend face to face. So I'm, that's what I'm asking in this question here. Um, in fact, let me see, I posed the question to section one, maybe I can just copy and paste that from before. Um, because yeah, that will make it easier. So I don't have to type this in here. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm typing it in here, and there's going to be two emoji that I will respond with. So click, no, click whichever one um, indicates your preference. So 
click the kind of computer if you plan to complete the class fully online, and that's an option for everybody. Um, click the kind of pillars, like temple looking building if you plan to come face to face as much as possible. So yeah, I'm just gonna watch those numbers go up. And I don't think you, the way this Discord thing works, I don't think you can see it up here above me, but right now they are, the numbers are going up, so it looks like you all are voting, which is correct. I mean, that's you're doing what I asked, so it's, it's working. <laughs> Looks like we got 20 viewers on the Twitch stream, so looks like a few more of you, if that's the number of you that are also in Discord, then um, you can do that uh, there. If you are watching in Twitch and you can't switch to Discord, you can also just type your um, reference. So Loretta, are you in the right Discord? Because I, I, saw, I see your comment on Twitch, but I don't see you in Discord. I mean, I do see you, I see you online in Discord. Or actually, no, you're offline in Discord. Uh, but I saw you a minute ago, and I sent a link to the server before class. But you can also just tell me your preference in the Twitch chat. But we, we want to get you into the uh, Discord chat if possible. Actually, let me type to a message to Loretta. Oh, there you are. I see you typing now. So it looks like currently we've got, um, okay, so Loretta, do you see the, do you see, I'm, ty I'm typing to Loretta, but I can also say, do you see the message just above the one you typed? There's, uh, your, <laughs> below it are two icons. So click the one that corresponds to your choice. So click on the computer if you plan if you plan to complete the class fully online. Yeah. And this is just a straw poll. This isn't committing you to anything uh, or the if you plan to uh, come face to face. Yeah, okay. So um, in any case, this isn't a commitment on either side. This is just a, a straw poll where I'm, I'm trying to see what you want to do and kind of where the numbers are. In fact, this, this already gives me the information that I wanted to know, which is, um, is the number of people that want to attend face-to-face -face greater than the number of people that we can fit into our classroom, and it is. So that means we're gonna effectively need to create three different cohorts for this section, um, and also three different cohort, th three cohorts for the first section, which is okay, um, but that's uh, that's gonna be a little complicated, and I'll, I'll make sure to, to plug you into the right cohort. Uh, but let me show you how that's gonna work logistically, and we can talk about it further. Because uh, currently we've got 15 who have said face-to-face -face and two that have said online fully, and there may be others that haven't voted yet. So, um, but, either, but even if there are, those are people that want to go fully online. There's still enough face-to-face -face that we need to think about this, this plan as I'm going to propose it to you now. So this is my proposal for what a typical two-week uh, rotation looks like. And this idea of doing it in two weeks um, was suggested by Amber in section one. And I think it makes sense. Um, so I'm proposing it to you now. Um, I will give you an opportunity to signify which of these you want to be part of, but let me explain the idea first. So um, Monday, online synchronous, Friday, online synchronous. There are different forms of online synchronous that includes a Twitch stream like this and a Zoom conference like we did on Wednesday and possibly different things in Discord. Um, but that's the idea is that you would be online. All you all you would need to do logistically ahead of time is just be online, like have a computer, be ready to go. Um, so there'd be different things you might do, but you're online wherever you are. The uh, Wednesday is where we have a differentiated experience where on let's say week one, which would be like, um, next week. Uh, it, half of you are there face to face and the, everyone else is doing something online synchronously on their own without me. Um, and then the following week it's inverted. So people that were on online in week one are now in face to face in week two. I've called these blue and red teams. So blue team is face to face on this on, a, a, on the first week in this group and then they're online in the second week in this group and vice versa with the red team. 
Um, I might do different colors, but I want to just kind of get the idea that there are essentially uh, two different face-to-face -face cohorts and then an implied third cohort that's always online during those times. Um, I want to think of it this way because I think this is a class where we can have a lot of really interesting discussions and sometimes discussions can be uh, better managed face-to-face -face, and I want to give you all that opportunity and, uh, and it's a good way to learn, it's a good way to enjoy kind of uh, experiencing the, these works that we're going to be studying. So um, I want to provide that opportunity for as many of you as, as possible um, and then at the same time create something for those of you that are fully online that's equivalent or that um, can carry the same value hopefully. Um, but that'll be, a, it'll be a slightly different experience. I mean, it definitely, uh, it will be. Um, I, I'm, I'm not gonna rule this out, but I, I don't think it really works as well for me to lecture from the classroom. So I think those days will, yeah, I mean, I might, but I think the best use of my time in that space is to talk with the people that are there as opposed to online. And I think you're, you guys can have a similar or you know a valuable experience without me online, um, at least on those Wednesdays. That's, that's the idea. Okay, so let me move on. So this is the continuing to lay out the, um, the proposal here. So online synchronous, like I said, Twitch, like I'm doing now, Discord, like we can do, um, you know, Discord is there for kind of the general purpose conversations, but we can also do things with video. Um, I have to look at upgrading my, both my PC and my Discord account, but if I can, then I might be able to do some things uh, like streaming video through Discord. Uh, which might be useful as an alternative to Twitch sometimes because there might be some things that I want to show you that for copyright reasons would get uh, muted on Twitch. That's what I've learned. That's what Twitch does. Like if you put something out that um, flags a copyright violation, they will just mute that part of your stream, which could be really inconvenient uh, for me if I'm trying to teach you something. So the uh, so Discord, I think, will be safer for that kind of thing, and so we might do it that way, but I need to upgrade my hardware and my account to make that actually viable. So that's a kind of to be determined kind of thing. But if nothing else, uh, Discord, we can chat, we can type things in, in Discord. Uh, and then of course, Zoom. I mean, Zoom is not bad either for a conversation. And if we wanna have a conversation with multiple people, then you know, Zoom is not a, not a terrible way to do that. So that's something that we might do um, uh, maybe more often on Fridays. Um, but again, with the, all of these options, my assumption is that you don't really need to know I mean, I will tell you ahead of time, but you don't need to need to know that long ahead of time which of these options we're gonna do. As long as you're online, you know, click the link and, and you're there. Like, I'll, I'll tell you when we're getting ready to go live, and certainly, um, but, you know, I, I, won't have, I won't necessarily have these plotted out like weeks in advance, um, but certainly, you know, days in advance. So that's what it is to be online. Uh, for the face-to-face -face experience, um, we are in this classroom, HCC 329. It's the one with the green chairs, if you're familiar with the HCC. Um, there are fewer there right now. Um, there are, I think, 10 uh, actual, nine, I, if, yeah, I guess they're 10. Uh, the, the, the capacity is 10, although I feel like last time I was there, it was laid out so that there were like three rows of three for nine, so I'll double check. But I've been told that the capacity is 10, so we're gonna go with that. Um, and that is basically half of, uh, you know, half of the section at most. So uh, these are gonna be, you know, it's, it's gonna be a conversation for these face-to-face -face experiences if you're in one of those cohorts. Um, you know, there's certain norms and certain things that you have to do in that space, and I'll remind you of what those are, but basically there's gonna be the sanitizing wipes near the door, so uh, the idea is you, you get one as you walk in, wipe down your desk before you uh, sit down, and then we have class, and then you uh, wipe things down again before you leave, and you know, that's pretty much it. But basically stay in your square, like there, the floor is taped off in a grid, and so the idea is you're supposed to stay in your uh, in your grid space if you are in there. And so that's pretty much the only thing. It's weird and awkward at first, but it's not too bad once you get used to it. All right, do you have any questions about these diff this proposal? Um, my plan is to create in Canvas, um, like give you a, a way in Canvas to signify which modality you wanna do and then give you cohorts to elect yourself into, if that makes sense. Um, so I'll, I'll share the plans for how to do that. But do you have any questions or, or thoughts about this particular way of doing things for class going forward. Let's see Naomi typing a question or typing. Maybe it's a question. It's looking at my eye. I will, yes. And, and actually what I what I'm gonna try to do in Canvas is um, like when it, whenever I create groups in Canvas, I think I can set it so that you can sign up for a group. Like you can say I want to be part of this group. So that would be, you know, you would be choosing that essentially. 
I think I can do that. <laughs> I haven't tried that yet, but that, I believe that's an option. So give me a chance to try that out. If nothing else, I mean, we will all be face to, I mean, we all, we will, ah, we will all be online you know, Monday anyway for the streaming, but this idea of being in person would start on Wednesday, like assuming, you know, campus isn't closed or something, we will be uh, face to face for the first time, some of us, uh, this coming Wednesday. Let's see, moon moon typing. So, okay, so I'll let moon moon Okay, so yay for some in person. Yeah, right, it's good to see people in person uh, when we can. Okay, so uh, with that out of the way, here's our goals. And I see now we have, how long is this? When does this class end? 12, 10? Man, okay, I got, that took longer than I thought. I wanna rush through, <laughs> through this, but I wanna talk about electronic literature. Um, I wanna talk about how to talk about electronic literature using 10 Lost Boys as the example. And uh, your homework, if I can get the list together, is going to be to look at more works, but works from different forms and to try to get a kind of comparative set of things to look at across different forms like hypertext and interactive fiction and digital poetry and generative art and so on. Um, I'm still working on that list. If I can't get that list together by like midnight tonight, just skip it, there won't be any homework. But if I can get it together, I will put it in Canvas and then I will ask you to look at those things and, and respond to them and be ready to think about them some more on Monday. But let's take a look at 10 Lost Boys. Uh, first impressions and questions. This is a good place to start. Usually this is, if, if I'm having a discussion-oriented day of class, I would just kind of throw this out and we would kind of talk through this. And this sometimes this conversation actually takes the whole, the whole time. But uh, yeah, just go ahead and type your thoughts. I mean, you could type your uh, something or you could copy and paste from your response that you wrote in Canvas. That's kind of the idea with those that you kind of have a pre, um, uh, pre-made uh, canned response that you can supply if nothing else. So yeah, first impressions and questions about 10 Lost Boys. What did, what are you? Where are you coming from? Because uh, this is work that I, res I respond to in a certain way and, and I, I think of it in a certain way. It has to, to do with um, all of the things about myself and the, the you know where I live and, and what I think about. Uh, that Those all inform my response to it on an aff affective level, emotionally. I do find it an emotionally disturbing work. Um, and I interact with different parts of it. Um, the, uh, the uh, like the, I mean, for one thing, I mean, the idea of a, of a lost boy, right? I mean, this is a book, this is a work that deals with, with gender in certain ways and specifically masculinity, I think. Um, the, uh, you know, I am the, a father, I have a boy, I have a son, he's eight years old. He's about the age that I imagine the boy in this game to be when it, it starts. And so I, it's, it's hard for me not to see certain choices and, and things that he's interested in now in, in the character that is created, uh, even if it's not actually someone who has the same name. Um, it's also, um, you know, I think about my own life. I mean, I'm a boy, I'm a man. I'm, I grew up uh, with, uh, in certain ways, I recognize, I recognize many of the choices that are made available to you as a player from my own life. Uh, oh yeah, so Sarah's copied it. Is that a screenshot, Sarah? I guess so. That's one way to do it, right? Yeah, and the, the tattoos, so Reddy it mentions the tattoos, that's a that's the real turning point, I think. That's where it's like, oh no, this is something else, I think. And there's that's the record scratch sound, right? So it's like, oh man, right? Um, this is uh, this is good. Yeah, so many of you are, are reflecting on a lot of these things. It does, um, yeah, the record scratch does, it is jarring, right? Um, I'm kind of going back through to see some of your comments. Um, and, and, and FGUP makes an interesting claim here. I, I didn't just instinctively make a neo-Nazi. That's a really interesting observation, right? Because that is where you can end up. Um, I mean, it, uh, all the different outcomes for your character are, are, are bad, you know, spoiler alert. Um, some of them are explicitly neo-Nazi, others are just white supremacist or misogynist or other kinds of versions of that. But um, yeah, it, it's, I, I, I would like to, to think about that more like not doing it instinctively, like you weren't trying to be a white supremacist. But I think one of the things you notice is that you, within the game, you can't not be, right? And that's what's really interesting about this work is that it does give you these choices, but it, it puts you on a path that's already set. Like there's really no way off of that path. And that's, I think, what's really kind of dark and disturbing about it, or that's, you know, about the claim that underlies this work. That, that's what's disturbing is the claim under it. Right, yeah, so we see this whole idea of choice, right? So Elena's pointing out, like, you do try to, even if you sense the hunch or sense the twist or after you've played it once, you know the twist, 
if you try to resist it, you kind of can't. And like, what does that, what does that make? I mean, what does that, where does that leave us in terms of how we think about this character? All right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Sarah, that's a great question there um, because the title obviously is a reference. And so, uh, and they're quotes from the, from Jane Barry uh, in the work that show kind of the Peter Pan context. It does seem to imply it. And we almost might make sense to go back to um, Peter Pan and kind of see what the status of the Lost Boys is and how that kind of works. But this is, um, this is a really important question. Like, are these boys really lost or can we find them or what could they do? What are the choices that they didn't have that we wish they had? And can we provide those choices to the real lost boys and that we know in our life? Um, you know, I think about like, yeah, there's so many things that for the first couple of choices that are so close to me in my life and my son and his life that I'm forced to confront, like, what are the things that happened to me or that I encountered that led me, that didn't lead me down that path? And, you know, thinking about people I know that, you know, grew up, I grew up with that have gone down that path, you know, what's different about us ultimately? Is it that I had different opportunities? Um, I got lucky, like, what is it? Like, and how, how do we understand how to make sure that that doesn't happen again? Um, this game, as you noticed, uh, it came out last year. So it was before um, the insurrection on January 6th, which had, you know, was led by white supremacists, among others. But um, it's the kind of game that has a different kind of resonance now, I think, because of that, because we kind of see, you know, the, the danger of white supremacy is obvious now. Uh, I think it always has been, but it's even more visible and disturbing than ever. So, you know, that's something that we have to, that's another kind of lens that we have to keep in mind as we look through this work. Uh, okay, so good discussion, good ideas. Um, uh, so let me back up a little bit because I want to talk about kind of how to approach this, and you all are already doing it, but I want to kind of do a couple more kind of foundational things. So if we think about a, a literature class, um, like, a, you know, the kinds of things that we can ask about a book or the kinds of things we can think about when we study a book, um, let's take Peter and Wendy by J.M. Barry. This is a work, I mean, this is just, I'm picking this one basically randomly, but uh, obviously not randomly because it's the work that is in the background of 10 Lost Boys. Um, when we study literature, we ask a specific set of questions, or there are certain questions that come to mind when we're asked to study a book, and we can say certain things about it. Like we, in a literature class, but even just as a reader, there are certain things we want to know about a book, or if someone's read a book and we want to ask them if they liked it or not, there's certain kinds of things we want to know about it or certain properties of the book that we think of as available for discussion, right? So what are just some of the basic questions um, and, you know, hypothetical questions that you might ask about a book? And I, it can be any book, so I'm just, I'm thinking very generally, like, who is the author? What other kinds of questions would you ask besides, like, who is the author if you wanted to uh, try to understand a book or if you're getting ready to write a paper about a book, like, what are the things that you would want to know about that book before you wrote it? So... Uh, yeah, just type them in the chat in Discord as they occur to you. This can be very vague or very specific. Uh, it doesn't matter. In fact, I'll go ahead and type a few on the slide as they come up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, good one. When was it written? Okay. Yeah. Why did the author write it? <laughs> So that gets a little bit into the intentional domain, but that's that's fine. Um, yeah, sure. And again, we're, we're talking. You know, this is a, we're, we're first kind of thinking about um, it as a book. Yeah, you know, so like imagining a book. Um, so uh, was it satire, or you might even say like, you know, what genre is it? Satire being a genre um, does imply specific purposes for a book, and so that's the kind of thing genre does as a category. But that's certainly we would know what is the genre. Um, let's see. Yeah, so yeah, similarly, Sarah, I'd like the idea of genre here could tell us that as well. Um, I think we can also think even more prosaically. So I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna add a few more here too. Like, you know, how long is it? Um, what is it about? Uh, does it use uh, symbolism, allegory, etc.? cetera? Um, right, who are the characters? What is the plot? Uh, when is it set? <laughs> when, is, when is the setting? When or where, I guess, is the setting? Yeah, so these are some good ones. Can you think of any more? I mean, these are I'm, these are the really basic questions. This is what I'm thinking of, like really fundamental kind of questions. Um, 
Yeah, I see some more people talking. talking. Yeah, Bobby, good connections to Lord of the Flies, too. I think you definitely see that, especially, like, um, I mean, the idea of, like, boys and having their own society. That, that's sort of what happens, if I remember correctly, in Peter Pan. Like, the lost boys have their own sort of world and their society, and it's, it's uh, actually really violent, kind of like the um, uh, Lord of the Flies. Um, yeah. How about... What kind of paper is it printed on? Sure, yeah. How does it end? Good. End, yeah, sir. Um, what is its vocabulary? Yeah, so these are all good questions. Um, and also, these are these are questions that we could ask certainly of electronic literature, as you as you're, I think, correctly um, imagining here. <laughs> See you all typing. So good. Um, yeah, and so Bailey, you're, that's a good question about Lost Boys. Is there any way to get a good ending? And there's not. But the idea of getting an ending, that's usually something we think about for, um, you know, electronic works. But in thinking about print works, usually we don't have, it's like we just have one ending. So it's not a, a question of getting it. It's just there. Uh, but yeah, right. Um, so you're good. Uh, you, know, what, um, you know, what typeface <laughs> is it printed in? Uh, so again, in thinking about these questions and posing them towards books, I think we could um, we could focus on different ones, and so as a literary scholar or a student of literature, you might choose specific sets of these questions to focus on. You might decide that some of these questions are not important, like you might not care what typeface it's printed in, uh, but another critic might. Like that might make a big deal for a critic, particularly like in a textual uh, textual studies context. Uh, that's the kind of thing that those scholars focus on uh, sometimes. So th uh, these are all different questions. There's plenty of more. Um, there's a whole lot more you could say about any any book, and certainly we do in literature classes, and this is good. Um, I think other these other cultural issues, right? I mean, other kinds of questions implied by some of these questions. Um, but what, the point I'm trying to make is that we could array all these different elements out, and uh, they would give us a set of things to look for, like metaphor, symbolism, characterization, uh, typography, and so on. And those things that we choose to focus on as a critic would say a lot about the book, but also say a lot about our critical perspective. So as a, a critic that is um, you know, coming from a textual studies point of view, we would focus on um, errata and, and printing and uh, choices of font and how that impacts the meaning of the work. Uh, someone focused from, uh, let's say, like a, like a gender point of view might focus on um, different characters and their genders and how their, their roles in the novel are portrayed vis-a-vis -vis their gender and so on. Like there's ways that we would look for those kinds of things. Um, and that would determine our, that would also be specific to our uh, intellectual approach. So my argument basically is simply that we have in video, in studying something that's electronic and electronic work, uh, I, almost said video, I almost said video games, but I think it's also true of video games, but for electronic works, we have all of those. We can talk about the typefaces, we can talk about the characterization, we can talk about the length, um, but we might have different answers to them. And, and we also have some new things that we can focus on as well. So when we have a digital artifact, there are certain things that we, can add. We don't have to. Uh, these aren't always significant, but we, we can add to that list of things that we're looking for as a critic or someone studying these things. We can ask questions like, what program did they use to create it? What program do I need to use in order to experience it? So these are actually different in many cases. Like in this case, for example, use Twine and then a macro for Twine called SugarCube. Um, I simply need a web browser to experience it. Um, to make that happen, Twine generates HTML, and so my web browser accesses HTML, so HTML is a language that's part of that inter interface and that interaction. Um, how long does my experience last? Um, this is a work that you could draw out, like you could take, like some of the um, events are timed, but some of them are not in Tin Lost Boys, like you could just sit with a screen for as long as you feel like. Just like a book, you could sort of pause on a page as long as you feel like, but there's typically a range of you know five to 10 minutes for each experience, each playthrough of it. Um, the, uh, you know, these are questions again you're asking of electronic works. Um, this is a digital artifact, it's a, a software, piece of software, so we can also ask how big of the f a file is it. Um, this one I think is like 185 kilobytes, something like that, so it's pretty small, but it much, if it were, if we were accessing this on a dial, accessing this on a dial modem, that might take it a little bit longer to download everything, or if we were looking at it, um, or if it, you know, had a, had a much richer media or something like that, that would be, something that would make it harder to access if you had a, a slower connection. Those are aspects of digital works that sometimes come to bear. Um, what modalities are used? This one uses uh, 
a little bit of imagery, but mostly text, but uh, text that is presented in certain ways. So it's arranged in certain ways and sometimes moves. So we have a little bit of animated text, um, but mostly it's text and audio are the two modalities that we get to have. Um, and in many cases with electronic works, there is a sense of choice. And so in this case, are we making choices or, and are those choices significant or exploratory? Uh, and exploratory just means like we're kind of seeing what's there. Significant would mean in this case that we actually make a difference to the world. Um, both can be good or bad. Like this, this isn't a value judgment, but I think one thing we could say about 10 Lost Boys is that ultimately our choices don't really matter basically because, I mean, they do, in terms of our appreciation and interpretation, but they don't in terms of the outcome because it always ends the same way. Um, so I see you all having an interesting conversation about tattoos, by the way. I'm going to get to that in a minute. I just want to get through these slides. Uh, are there aspects of it that are pre-scripted or emergent? Some works that we might see will have uh, randomness involved in them, and there is randomness here, but it's a constrained kind of randomness. Uh, it's not so much um, like it just goes off in different branches. Uh, and then ultimately, like, what am I supposed to do? Am I reading? Am I watching? Am I choosing? Am I um, clicking? Like, what are the things that I do? What are the verbs that would get through this? So, yeah, these are big questions. And ultimately, how different will each work be? Uh, each one of this particular work uh, and the, the about info on this tells us that there are, are over 10 billion possible ways to complete this work. And that's true. I think I, I did the numbers and it looks like that's certainly true. I didn't actually go all the way through the math, but I, I started and it looks like that's true. Um, so, yeah, what do we do, right? So let me see. Actually, I'm going to go back into chat because you are talking about the game a bit. Um, lots of... Yeah, I, the, if you look actually, um, if, you, if you look at the, um, uh, the, the comments on itch.io for this, uh, Mark has replied to a couple questions about the tattoos and he chose all of those because they all have been used by white supremacists in some way. So there might, there's a specific lightning bolts, like I think it's the two together that go down like that. That's like the SS, looks kind of like the SS symbol. Um, uh, I, I don't know the spider one one specifically, but those all were chosen intentionally. Um, to indicate um, a kind of allegiance to a violent group of some sort. Yeah. And, and some of those are, are less clear than others. I mean, some of them are pretty obvious, but some of them are more like coded. And they, yeah, if you learned about white supremacy, um, they have all these like code phrases that they'll use and code things so that they can kind of exist in normal society without being super visible sometimes. Um, you know, things like the number 88 can be like a code symbol for, um, for uh, uh, white supremacists, for, for neo-Nazis specifically. Uh, okay, so um, is it 14 and 14 too, the number 14. So if you see like 14 and 88 together, I think it's 14. Um, the 14 and 88 together is usually a neo-Nazi um, association, which is, I mean, it's annoying because these are just numbers, right? Numbers have... <laughs> Have value. Oh yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, uh, so who's, who's sharing that? Um, yeah, Zoe, thank you for sharing sharing that. Um, lots of uh, good good things to know there and uh, look for, I guess. Um, anyway, so when we look at Lost Boys, Ten Lost Boys, these are the things we can say about it um, to answer some of those questions that are specific to its digital context. Um, I did want to kind of play through it a little bit, but I think instead of that, I will actually show you under the hood uh, of it a little bit. So this is the here we go. Here's the game. I think I've got it muted, so um, can I, I don't know if I'm muting it on, turning it on or off if I hit type M there. Um, but as you can see, it's labeled a RPG character generator. I think that's an interesting um, context, right? Because RPG role-playing game, this is a character generator. I think that signals the way in which many of the choices that you see this character making are all about playing a specific role for a group or for a particular audience. And that idea of playing and kind of like, oh, this is just for, for lols, um, that is an, an indictment and a critique of the actual culture where people participate in these things. They might join up initially because they think it's funny, but then they're gradually being kind of um, led down this route that leads to uh, white supremacy um, and other kinds of horrible things. So, um, yeah, I'm actually not going to play it right now because I think you all have played it and also it, it kind of goes dark for a second. Um, I would actually wanted to look at it under the hood a little bit. So this is Twine, and the way Twine works is it's HTML, and HTML has lots of different affordances, but one of the affordances is for HTML is that unless you work really hard to obfuscate it, then HTML by default is open source. So that means like you can look at any web page and you can view the source. So if I look at this, this is the Reclaim Arcade page. If I just you know, control U on my browser, I can see this is the source code 
that generates this page. So if there's some part of it that I find interesting and I want to try to use on my web page, I can look at the source code and see how they did it and then you know copy it and then try to do it there. Um, this one is a little bit obfuscated because they're using WordPress and the Elementor plugin, which I can tell because of all the class names here. But the point is, HTML is legible. Like it's not a compiled format. Um, you can actually look at it. Uh, when we'll, we'll talk about Flash a little bit later, Flash is a compiled format, and that's really unfortunate because we can't look at the source code of a Flash project unless it's, unless the creator chooses to share it, and most of them don't. So it's very hard to recreate those works uh, after the fact. Uh, but anyway, this is the source code for 10 Lost Boys, and much of this you don't, I mean, you can kind of skim it and learn about it, but unless you really know what you're looking for, it may not make sense. But you can see the full text here, and you can see all of the different options. It looks a little bit more sensible if you import it in, into Twine, which I've done here. So I took the source code from Mark Sample's game, and I'm looking at it here. And this is a much more complexly coded Twine project than you'll normally see. Um, if you have coded Twine yourself or you choose to, it's usually you have a brand, like a passage, which are these squares uh, up here, and then they branch off into different options, and then they kind of go that way. There's a lot of branching here, but a lot of it is actually being handled by variables. So you can actually learn, I think, more about the work if you look at this passage. So this is ultimately kind of the um, fundamental kind of code of the game. And what I wanted to show you, even if you don't understand the context here, is that if we look at the list, so whenever you start the game up, you choose a name for your boy, and then it says, I think there's 10 choices, and then it says, but it could, but there, it says something like, but there are many more, and it could have been, and there's a list of other names. Um, those names are all chosen from this list. Um, there's 247, I think, um, of these on this list. Um, so whenever he says in the about pages that there's over 10 billion possibilities, he means that this choice, the set of options com from this choice combined with the set of options from the next choice combined with the set of the options from the next choice basically increase geometrically the number of possible total choices. Um, so this to me, this is kind of a, a question I wanted to pose to you all, like why are there so many names? Like, why not just um, 10? Like, why not just pick 10 specific names off the top of, your, uh, of their head? Why come up with this list and choose a subset of this list? So this is a, a design choice or a programming choice by the creator. And so we can kind of think of this in terms of what was Mark Sample intending with this, but we can also think of it in terms of what, what does this tell us about the work and our experience of it? Or, or how does this help us understand the different possibilities we might have experienced but, but didn't? Okay, yeah, okay, great great answers here. So we've got two. Um, so Moon Moon says names make it more personal. Uh, Kaiyu points out possibly will increase the chance of a name we know. Absolutely. So um, I'm in here. Eric says that they're in here. So where am I? I'm in here somewhere. <laughs> There I am. Yeah, so, um, so Zachary could be the name. There's actually multiple spellings of Zachary here as available. Uh, there's Daniel. That's my son's name. Uh, it, and these are all very common names. I, I imagine Mark just went for a list of like the top 250 male names. Um, yeah. Yeah, and great point FK up there too, that it gives us a sense of, it, it does both of these things. It gives us a sense of specificity, but also scale. Like it could be any one of these people, each of these individuals, but we're talking about potentially 10 billion or 250 or you know, whatever, whichever scale you're talking about, but like it's also this huge thing. So it's both this very specific, narrow, hyper narrow thing and this huge thing. And that's a really challenging thing to try to get across as a, as a writer or a creator, but I think this kind of design helps us think that way. So we could even go as specific as like, I could have, and I didn't get this choice, but it could have presented me with something like Zachary, um, from, and my hometown is in here, Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, I don't know where it is because there's a thousand different hometowns here. But you know, what is it? But we might also get things like Dylan from Columbia, South Carolina, right? I mean, th these could be, is it Columbia that he's from? But anyway, that's where he, you know, the uh, Dylan Roof, the um, mass shooter, right? So these are names that we might actually know personally or know as no notorious individuals uh, from this, this kind of world. And I think that's the really disturbing part of this, or that's where it manages to be disturbing because it kind of shows you how close these things might have been or how close these people might be to us um, or, and, uh, or, or how close we might have been or might be to becoming them. And that's what's really meant to be disturbing about this. I, I've checked Fredericksburg is not on the list, uh, but plenty of other places in Virginia are if you're from Virginia. 
Uh, so I think this helps us understand it uh, a little bit if we look at the code. And that's not always the case in electronic literature. Uh, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Um, sometimes authors will leave kind of um, quotes or, or uh, comments to themselves in the code, and that can help us understand their choices. Um, but uh, not in this case. I think this is just coded pretty straightforwardly. Um, but still seeing those choices and seeing the design, I think, really informs and helps us understand its potential for power and also the potential for different experiences with it. Like, I think this would have been a really different experience if it had presented me with, you know, my name and I had chosen it that way or my son's name. So, yeah, and so I think you're all seeing this, this here. Um, that's that's a, a way to appreciate it in this context. Um, okay, there's, there's a lot more to say about it. I think that was, uh, we did actually manage to get to the, I think, the big question, which was, like, what does that sense of scale do for this work and for your experience of it? Um, another big question that I think comes up, and it came up a bit more in section one, they actually kind of went straight for this, is um, like, what is the ultimate takeaway here? Like, are we meant to sort of feel bad for white supremacists? Like, are we meant to see neo-Nazis and feel that, you know, they used to be a little boy and we should feel bad about the loss of that little boy? Um, I think that's part of this. Um, I think there's a critique that, that was made in the first section that like maybe we shouldn't feel bad for them. Like maybe, you know, we, you know, they're the problem. Like, and we shouldn't try to sympathize with them or give them time. Yeah, Bobby's saying that too, just now. Um, so I, I, I agree with Bobby. I don't think we should feel bad for them, but I think we should, I think the warning in this game is to think about, I, I can't help but think about the people that I know that have gone down that path and how similar our lives were up until a certain point. And I can't help but think about like what was different about my life that meant I didn't go down that route. And what are the things that I can do, you know, uh, for uh, my son to make sure he doesn't go down those routes. Also, what can we do about those routes? Like, you know, we talk in, in, at one point you can be online in, in this game, like on Gab. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember if Parler is an option, but you know, you know, Gab, 4chan, 8chan. I mean, should these spaces, should we do something about these spaces and these routes and can we kind of turn the ship around to make those things, um, you know, less bad? I don't know. Anyway, so good discussions here. I haven't been able to follow it all in as I've been talking, but um, I appreciate the thoughts. And I'll, I'll jump in on the chat here in a minute. Uh, but I want to wrap up the stream because I've gone past the, the scheduled time. And I want to, <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you all for joining and, and your ideas in the chat. This is good. This kind of conversation would have been fun to have in person too, but uh, I think the nice thing about having a text-based chat is like you all can kind of put all your ideas out there at once and then kind of they all get heard and as opposed to in, in class, maybe we kind of go and take a conversation in a direction that is different. You don't get a chance to share your ideas, but I appreciate that. Thank you for uh, those thoughts. I am going to wrap up the stream. Of course, this will be archived, so you can watch it later if you want to, um, or maybe you are already um, watching it. I don't know why you'd want to watch it again, but uh, if you're watching this after the fact, that's fine. Just uh, stay tuned. I'm going to send you some messages, uh, hopefully tonight, about how to signify which modality you want to sign up for and some homework to look at for, for Monday. So thanks for chatting. Thanks for watching. I'm going to wrap up the stream here. I'll be online, though, for a little bit so if you want to chat further. I'm going to try to jump in on this chat. It looks like there's a lot of things uh, people are talking about. All right, cool. See you later. Um, have a good weekend.